Hi everyone, uh, so I'm Bart and I'm here today with my students Sonu and Arisha. And since this is a past, present, future paper, we're gonna take you on a journey through the world of recommendations. So think back to your first time. I mean, the first time you went to a recommender systems conference, right? Think back about it. So my first time at a recommender systems conference, Francisco Martin was giving the keynote talk, 2009. And he said to a room full of researchers, mostly doing research on algorithms, he said, wait a minute, doing research on the algorithm is not enough. And that's a criticism that has been voiced by many researchers, right? Um, we all know uh, the work by Sean McNee and, and Dan Cosley. They did some work that showed that um, algorithms that work well offline in terms of accuracy are not always the best online performing algorithms. And so they wrote a paper called Being Accurate is Not Enough. Now, tomorrow, um, um, Michael Axtrand and Martijn Willemsen are going to present a paper that shows that using this behavior that we use sometimes to, uh, to, to make good recommendations, like the clicks and stuff, and we saw that in the keynote as well, that stuff is also not necessarily good enough. And um, Michael and Martijn will argue that this is because what we do right now is not always a good predictor of our future goals. And then Xavier, Amaterian and, and his co-authors, they show that when you re-rate certain items, users sometimes use different ratings. So the rating input that we use is also maybe kind of inaccurate, right? And then finally, Martijn and I helped Dirk Bolle and Mark Krauss to show that if you give people good recommendations, that actually can lead to choice overload and potentially a dead donkey, right? Anyone know about that? Yeah? Okay, so Generally speaking, these, these authors point out some inaccuracies, some, some shortcomings of existing recommender systems. And so we have certain ways to overcome these inaccuracies. So one of them is to uh, more carefully display recommendations, for instance, with a visualization like in a taste weight system. Or to use more intuitive input mechanisms, like the work of Pearl Pu and uh, Li Chen or uh, by diversifying the recommendations. We uh, just this week published a paper on this in the UMOI journal. Or, of course, user-centric evaluation, which is something that I've done a lot of work on. But there is one criticism that kind of attacks the very core of recommender systems. Do we know what it is? The filter bubble, right? Who actually read the book, The Filter Bubble? There's a couple of people. I think we should all read it. It's a really interesting book. So in it, Eli Pariser argues that as recommenders show us the items, only show us the items that they think we like, they automatically shield us from a broader variety of viewpoints and experiences. So he is worried that as we show people recommendations, we might be missing out on discovering good items. Now, there have been some researchers who've shown that the, rec that the filter bubble problem it indeed exists to some extent in, in recommender systems. But regardless of whether the filter bubble is real or not, maybe we should be figuring out why users fear these filter bubbles, right? So psychologically, the filter bubble plays into our fear of missing out, FOMO. And so in terms of recommender systems, FOMO means that the joy of getting really good recommendations is actually spoiled by the worry that we might be missing out on other enjoyable items that were not being recommended. So that's, a, that's one problem, but I actually think that there is a more troublesome consequence of the filter bubble that we should be worrying about. And that is the possibility that users will eventually embrace the filter bubble. That's, that's not impossible, right? Because as we all know, recommender systems are actually quite persuasive. So by psychological mechanisms like defaults, default effects and, and uh, temporal discounting, 
we might be unknowingly behaving in a way that makes us better fit in with the recommender system. So rather than developing our own unique personal tastes, we may just be clicking and consuming whatever the recommender serves us, especially when the recommender keeps serving us uh, delicious brains or the internet equivalent cat videos, right? So to put this in the more eloquent words of um, Michael and Martijn, oh, sorry, going too far. Um, we may be uh, in a situation here where these recommender systems are reinforcing behavior that detracts us from our future goals and rather turns us into kind of mindless recommendation consuming zombies. The recommender system might be the next television. That's a problem. And I think we should all be working on solving this problem. And so we have one idea of how to solve it, and we call it recommender systems for self-actualization. And so the idea here is to have a recommender system that doesn't just, uh, doesn't just try to replace our decision-making practices, but instead tries to support us in exploring, developing, and understanding our own unique personal tastes. So I have now given you an idea of the past and present of recommender systems, and it seems only fitting for me to now hand it over to my students to present this exciting new future of recommender systems for self-actualization. Hi, I'm Sono. And I'm Darisia. We're graduate students at Clemson University. We just started on this project, so we aren't entirely sure yet how these recommenders will look. We have a few requirements, though. We want these recommenders to support rather than replace decision making, to focus on exploration rather than consumption, and attempt to cover all of users' needs. We do want to introduce you to a couple of ideas that support these goals, and they all revolve around alternatives to the traditional things we think you like or top end. For example, things we think you will hate. You normally don't get to see these predictions, but by showing you them, we can correct any potential mistakes. In this list, we show you items that you're predicted to rate much lower than the average user, thereby showing you the biggest predicted underperformers. And if we got one of them wrong, then we can add extra weight to the corrected rating. Next up, things we have no clue about. Recommenders often try to cash in on good predictions as soon as possible, but this means that they only match a narrow subset of your preferences. But nobody's that unidimensional, right? What about your other preferences? By showing you a list of highly uncertain items, the system can learn about those as well. You see, recommenders typically don't give you a confidence interval, which is something we may change. Uh, another way to discover uncertainties is by using an ensemble of algorithms where we choose the items with the most disagreement. Next up, things you'll be among the first to try. Recommender system research. Oh, wait, you guys have been trying to overcome the cold start problem in many innovative ways. We propose a much simpler solution. You know how some people love to try new things and then brag about this one band that you've never heard of? Well, we propose to identify these hipsters and then and give the, and we propose to identify these hipsters by their high percentage of top rated items with relatively few ratings and then show them much more of these items. And finally, things that are polarizing. Recommendations are usually based on the preferences of similar users, right? These similar users are typically the ones feeding your recommendations based on the things that they like best. But what if these users are divided about certain controversial items? Normally, these contradictory ratings are just canceled out. By showing you these items, users could develop that their tastes that go beyond the mainstream. So we are currently designing a user experiment that shows you one of these alternative lists next to the traditional top end list. 
In this experiment, we, we propose not only to measure user satisfaction, but also the system's potential for self-actualization. So yeah, we will probably use uh, DeepMars framework for, for that as well. So to conclude, we believe that by um, exploring items that go beyond the traditional top end, that recommender systems can get a much deeper understanding of our personal preferences. But more importantly, we believe that by experiencing these items, these new sets of, of alternative items, recommender, these recommender systems can also teach you more about your own personal tastes and, and develop your, your own personal preferences. So and I think that that's a very important aspect of recommender systems that we have been neglecting for a while. And so I want us to focus on this so that maybe 10 years from now at the next anniversary of the Recommender Systems Conference, we might be um, able to claim that rather than creating mindless zombies, these recommender systems have turned us all into culturally diverse and tenacious individuals. And that's our view on the future of recommender systems. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Wonderful. We have time for one to two questions. And I think we have people who are eager to deliver those questions. Um, right back there. Uh, I have a challenging question. Is it ready, ready for that? Ah, yeah. uh, I think it's all great ideas. Uh, so when we stop calling that systems a uh, recommender system and start going back to the word user adaptive system or something like that? Because generally what you're talking about is a great idea which we explore in the field of user modeling for a number of years. So just in recommender systems, uh, it can be basically a ranking, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware that there was a big difference, right? I mean, <laughs> recommenders have been starting to be integrated into our systems so much more over the last couple of years, we're, we're, not, we're often not using just simple ranking methods anymore. And I think that this is one alternative that we can use. And indeed, maybe it's just a, a user adaptive system rather than a, than a recommender system. Great. And our other question over there. Hi, that's a great talk. I love it. Um, my question is, um, you talk about you want to find um, the, the stuff that people hate. So um, how do you differentiate things that they hate and things that are just completely irrelevant? So I think one of the things would be, well, irrelevance is part of the context, right? So irrelevance is, is, is a context-based um, uh, um, lower rating, I would say. So we probably need to take context into account when, when doing rating prediction, and I think we should do that anyway. <laughs> but so the idea is once we take context into account and once we take even the average rating of the item into account, then what is the, what is the even further lower negative value that users are predicted to give to this item? And, and we can have a couple of wrong ones in there that, that, that were um, relevant in the past and irrelevant now, or that were irrelevant in the past and are, that are indeed relevant now. And I think that's one of the reasons to have that list, is to be able to say, yeah, I didn't like this in the past, but guess what? Now it actually does apply to me. So yeah, that's one of the reasons to have the list, actually. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's thank them again for diversifying how we think about recommendations.